Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to talk about in this section is the human family, children, blood and marriage, and who your FBZ actually is. Because we're going to talk about the organization and structure of kinship. We're going to talk about the human family, and we're going to follow that outline right up above my head as we do so. Now, the idea of kinship, the idea that there is only a set number of patterns that human society falls into, this was one of the major discoveries of kind of the golden age of anthropology from the 30s uh, until the 80s, in which these guys went out, and here's four of them right up above my head, in which these anthropologists went out and they made this very major discovery about human kinship. The idea and the concept that there are set patterns in human cultures, that there are a, only a set number of options that each human society self-organizes itself around. And not only is there a limited set, limited number of options for human societies to self-organize, that these options, these kinship structures function in a way to meet the needs of the people in that society, the needs of the people in that culture. It was, it was a major discovery and a discovery that continues to have implications even till today. Now, kinship, I, I find kinship to be a particularly fascinating structure. I, I love reading about different ways to kind of arrange the different pieces of the human family. And again, there's only a finite number of ways you can sort of reorganize the human family. Or, and there are these sort of set patterns that human societies fall into. And if this is the kind of stuff that interests you, uh, here are some excellent recommended texts there on the left. Kinship, Marshall Solon's The Archaeology of Kinship. Bradley Enzer's book is, is really quite good. And this is a really good way to how to understand how human societies organize themselves around the principle of kinship, how human societies construct the human family. Now, what is kinship? Kinship itself is, of course, the relationship by persons, either through marriage or by blood. All human societies use kinship as a central organizational principle in, to structure themselves. And now there's many different ways they can arrange different pieces, but there's only a, a finite number of options on the board. Now, kinship determines a lot. It determines the structure of the human social network. Uh, kinship is how we determine loyalties. It's how we sort of frame social relationships. It's how we claim descent. It's how we determine inheritance. And within these kinship structures, you have kinship relations. There are basically only three types of kinship relations, consanguinal, affinal, and fictive. And we'll run through them very quickly. Consanguinal relationships are uh, relationships by blood, when individuals share related genetic material. Consanguinal relationships are the relationships that an individual has with their siblings, with their parents and grandparents, or with their children or grandchildren. Uh, consanguinal relationships are generally contrasted against affinal relationships. Affinal relationships are when people are connected through marriage. It's the uh, relationships that one has with, for instance, one's spouse or one's spouse's family. Like you, you would be related to your uh, spouse's parents. That's an affinal relationship. And the third type is a fictive relationship. And a fictive relationship is when someone is basically incorporated into the family unit, into the conjugal unit, um, but they don't actually have any sort of direct genetic or direct marriage relationship. They kind of, everyone just acts as if they have a place in the family. It's called a fictive relationship. Um, I'll give you an example very quickly. Uh, my parents had a really, really good friend, uh, Jack, and I basically grew up calling him Uncle Jack. Now, I am not actually related to my old Uncle Jack in any way. Uh, the relationship I had with him was purely fictive. It was a fictive relationship. And sometimes entire social groups can be constructive out of fictive relationships. Now, uh, human society, human kinship systems are made up of these sort of social units called kin groups. And a nuclear family is an example of a kin group, uh, which is a, a culture's a basic unit of kinship. And here is uh, basically what I'm talking about right up above my head. This is a conjugal unit or the nuclear family. And it exists as, uh, at least for our culture, as the mental template of what we consider to be an idealized family. You've got one, you've got both parents and you've got like 2.1 children or 1.8 children, whatever the average number of children is these days. 
And basically the relationships within the conjugal unit are the two parents um, have uh, affinal relationships with each other, but consanguinal relationships with their children. Now it's time to meet the cleavers. There's the cleaver family right up above me. Let's see if you, if let's test your, your obscure TV trivia. Who remembers this TV show from the 1950s? That TV show is called Leave It to Beaver. And in Leave It to Beaver, they had kind of this idealized American family that I have sort of constructed using anthropological symbols to my left. And we're gonna run down exactly what these symbols mean later, but, but for now, an equal sign is marriage, a triangle is male, a circle is female. And there is the Cleaver family on your left. You've got the parents, Ward Cleaver Jr. and his wife, June, as well as their, their two sons, Wally and Theodore the Beaver. All right, now, Ward and June, of course, have affinal relationships with each other. They are connected by marriage. But Ward Cleaver Jr. and his wife's parents, Theodore Bronson and Martha, he is connected to them through an affinal relationship. He does not actually share any close genetic material with his wife's parents, or at least one would hope not. But Wally and the beaver share consanguinal relationships with everyone in this chart. They share genetic relationship, of course, with both parents and their grandparents. But if you look at sort of uh, the beaver's grandfather, Ward Cleaver Sr., the relationship between Ward Cleaver Sr. and Theodore Bronson is completely affinal because those two old guys, they are connected through the marriage of their children. That is an affinal relationship. Martha and Ward, affinal. Maria and June, affinal. Maria and Wally, consanguinal. Ward Jr. and Ward Sr., obviously consanguinal. This is the different relationships that exist inside the sort of idealized American family, the Cleavers. Now, uh, in addition to sort of these different types of kin relationships, consanguinal, affinal, and fictive, you also have two different ways to look at human kinship. You have vertically and horizontally. And basically, vertically, kinship holds together the individuals of, of different generations and ensures the continuity of the kin group. It, it, it ensures the, inherited, the uh, passing of inheritance, names, properties, titles, whatever. Every human culture, every human society possesses very formalized rules for inheritance. And you can see this uh, in the Cleaver family as the Cleaver name is passed from father to son, from Ward Cleaver Sr. to Ward Cleaver Jr. to his two sons. And that type of vertical descent, we're going to meet that in just a tick. That's called patrilineality. But you also have horizontal kinship relationships, and those are kinship links uh, that, that links different kin groups together through affinal or fictive relationships. And it provides all the consanguinal members with social networks. Like, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the extended Cleaver family in just a bit, but if Ward Cleaver Jr. had a brother, and that brother had his own family, his own conjugal unit, that the horizontal connections between Ward Cleaver Jr.'s family and his brother's family, those would be a horizontal uh, kin relationships. Now, there's one thing you need to understand about kin relationships is that there is a difference between sort of the idealized families, these sort of idealized conjugal units like you see with the Cleavers. They were completely fictive. They didn't exist outside of television because generally idealized family structures do not exist very often in the real world. Real families are much, much messier things. They are these sort of cobbled together units connected by marriage, by history, by happenstance, by whatever. Real families rarely fit idealized kinship models. And indeed, one of the ways in which kinship structures seem to change through time is when de facto rules, when, when the way families end up being organized, uh, conflicts with sort of formalized rules. And it's the way in which de facto rules, things that are that occur in effect, transform into de jure rules, which are rightful rules. Eventually, de facto family organizations become, over time, if they're repeated often enough, become de jure rules. De facto becomes de jure. This was one of the key insights of a, of a kinship researcher called uh, Bradley Enzer. So the messy family structures, if they are repeated often enough, becomes the idealized formal family structure of tomorrow. Messy families today become the idealized family structure of tomorrow. Now, 
Um, in anthropology, there is a, symbol, a symbolic system in which you are able to sort of frame and organize and sketch out different kinship structures through time. And here are those symbols right up above me. Put them in your notebook. Basically, a triangle is male, a circle is female, an equal sign is married, an equal sign that's slashed out is divorced, an equal sign with parentheses means an unsanctioned union, a direct a solid line is basically descent and sibling relationships. A dotted line means fictive relationships. And there's a set number of codes by which you can sort of objectively discuss the relationships between people without referring to uh, the individual kinship system. And, and that code is there on the upper left. M for mother, F for father, S for son, D for daughter, B for brother, Z for sister, because of course the S was already used. H for husband and W for wife. So cultural anthropology largely issues subjective or endemic kinship terms like uncle or pal pal or gram gram uh, in favor of, of these sort of objective combinations that you see on the upper left. So your maternal uncle is your mother's brother, your MB, all right? His daughter would be your MBD, mother's brother's daughter, all right? And her husband would be you're basically your maternal uncle's daughter's husband would be your MBDH, mother's brother's daughter's husband, all right? This is how you sort of construct formal relationships within anthropology. So who is your FBZ? Who's your FBC? Your father's brother's sister. Now this is a trick question, of course, because your father's brother's sister would also be your father's sister. So there actually is no FBZ. It is only your FZ. Now, let me actually show you what all these symbols look like when they're sort of mapped out uh, with an extended family. Here is uh, the extended family from Leave it to Beaver. Now, uh, they attempted to kind of reboot the old Leave it to Beaver show in the 1980s, and it was around for like two or three seasons. It, it wasn't very good, but it doesn't matter because it gives me this wonderful kinship chart. So basically, the center of our kinship chart is... Theodore Cleaver, the beave himself. And the beaver is our ego. It's the center of our kinship chart. So who is his BD? His brother's daughter. Look at the kinship chart, write that question down, and answer it. Who is the beaver's BD? His brother's daughter. Ah, what about his MZ? Who is the beaver's MZ? His mother's sister. Look at the chart and write down the beaver's MZ, his mother's sister. What about his FBD? His father's brother's daughter. Father's brother's daughter. Write down his father's brother's daughter. What about his MBZ? That's of course, trick question, you don't have an MBZ. We are actually gonna do a kinship exercise of your own. You're going to take this fine, well-dressed, handsome fellow right up above my head. I. I think I got that off of like a symphony web page. It's a, I think he's a cello player for some philharmonic. But anyway, he would be quite shocked to know that his picture is being used in a cultural anthropology lecture. At any rate, we are going to call that fine, well-dressed fellow Robert. Robert is right up above my head. And on the left is Robert's family. This is an actual messy family that I, that I constructed with the help of a student a few years back. And I want you to read this description of Robert's family and diagram Robert's family in formal anthropological style using triangles and circles and lines and dotted lines and, and equal signs and, and all that jazz. So take Robert's family. This is Robert's family. Robert is married to his second wife named Margaret. His first wife was named Anne. Before he and Anne divorced, they had two children, Robert Jr. and Carl. Robert and Margaret have no children together, but they adopted Lisa and Sharon. Robert's parents were Frank and Linda. Frank was Linda's second husband, the first husband, Charles, having died long before she met uh, Frank. Linda and uh, Charles have two children, Richard and Edgar. Uh, Richard married Ellen and had three children. Uh, Richard Jr., Erica, and Tabitha. Edgar is currently cohabiting, they're not married, cohabiting with a woman uh, named Katya, uh, with whom he had a child called Ilyana. Frank himself uh, was an orphan and was 
uh, originally adopted by a much older couple, couple Chloe and Bela, Bela, Bela is a male name, uh, before emigrating to the United States. So take Robert's family that I have just described to you, give uh, diagram it just like I diagrammed the Cleaver family, and then we're going to talk about set patterns in lineality, locality, patriarchy, and matriarchy in the next section, and I will see you there.